today is Imperial Day, the Feast of St. Proxatus, the Holy Virgin. Again, good to be here again in Goa. That's a little bitty mini little retreat or contemplation here on this Monday. We'll read it here. We'll go ahead and read the epistle and the gospel for today. We don't always do this during the week, but today we will. In the epistle for this feast of St. Parksetus, Virgin, taken from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 7. Brethren, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, but I give counsel, as having obtained mercy of the Lord, to be faithful. I think, therefore, that this is a good for the present necessity that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound to a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But if thou take a wife, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have tribulation of the flesh. But I spare you. This therefore I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that they also who have wives be as if they had none. And they that weep, as though they wept not. And they that rejoice, as if they rejoice not. And they that buy, as though they possess not. And they that use this world, as if they used it not. For the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you be without solicitude. He that is without a wife, the solicitous for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please God. But he that is with a wife is solicitous for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. And the unmarried woman and the virgin thinketh on the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then you can stand for the gospel. Was taking that according to St. Matthew chapter 13. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hidden in a field, which a man, having found, hid it. And for joy, therefore, goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant seeking good pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went his way and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net cast into the sea, and gathering together all kinds of fishes, which when it is filled, they drew out, and sitting by the shore, they chose out the good into the vessels, but the bad they cast forth. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall go out and shall separate the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have ye understood all these things? And they say to him, Yea, yes. He said unto them, Therefore, every scribe instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, who bringeth forth out of his treasure new things and old. Thus far the words of the day's holy gospel. And we see it then. So today, a few considerations on these beautiful words, this little mini retreat here in Goa, and the epistle and the gospel today, the kingdom of heaven. He said, It is like unto a pearl of great price, and like a merchant searching for, searching for valuable pearls. Man goes and sells all he has and buys the pearl of great price. He goes and buys a field which has a treasure buried in it. But one of the things we note about these two, these two parables, the field has a treasure buried in it, and a man sells all he has and buys the field. There's a merchant who's searching for the pearl of great price. He finds it, 
sells all he has, and buys the pearl. What is included, or what is implicit in these two parables? One of them is the ignorance of the owner. Somebody owns that field, but he doesn't know that there's a treasure hidden in it. A man owns the pearl of great price. He doesn't know its value. Remember one time my brother, one of my little brothers, is a worker, he, they were selling in America, we have these swap meets. They call them swap meets in Kentucky, they call them uh, 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 markets, where the people take their old things, they bring them into it together, and they sell them. And sometimes they lay out on the table something very valuable, but they think it's only worth two dollars. I met a man just a couple weeks ago, and he was traveling through, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm visiting my, my, he was in Kentucky, he said, I'm visiting my uncle. He says, why are you visiting your uncle? He says, well, you know, he's a good uncle. And finally, after a few minutes, he says, you know, I found out that there was a little painting that we had in our house. And we were going to throw it away. And now I found out that the painting is worth about $50,000. I really want to see my uncle. <laughs> and when he finds his uncle, he says, you want that painting? Oh, you can have it. Okay, I'll take it off your hands. And he was really worried about his uncle. Unfortunately, his uncle had died, and the house was growing up in weeds, and we don't know what happened to the painting. <laughs> Another time, my brother... Buying tools, an old rusty tool. And he sees the tool there, it's worth about 300 American dollars. So what's that, about, uh, about 15,000, 16,000, 20,000 uh, rupees. And it was for sale for 20 rupees. And he said, well, I, I think I'll take this and I'll take that. Well, what is it? I don't know. Whatever. And he bought it. Now, what is included in the parable today? The field has a great treasure in it. But the owner of the field does not know that it has a great treasure, and he's ready to sell it. You know that in 1967 or 68, New York City, in America, they were throwing off their habits. After Vatican II, nuns don't need their habits anymore. They were throwing away the crucifixes. They don't need them anymore. They were breaking the stained glass windows. We don't need them anymore. One beautiful stained glass window in Kentucky, my home, where the monks had prayed for a hundred years in front of the image of the Blessed Virgin Mary every night in the Trappist Monastery of Gethsemane. They lit one light upon this holy window of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and they sang, Salve Regina, every night to her. And in 1967, it wasn't a beautiful window anymore. And the abbot said, we must make the monastery more modern. And they took sledgehammers, and they broke the window. They removed the window, and they replaced it with iron poles. And now there's a blank wall where it used to be the Blessed Virgin Mary. They didn't know the treasure of Mary anymore. And these nuns in 1967, about that year in New York City, they didn't need their habits anymore. And they used to have a silver crucifix that they would wear on the outside of their habit. So they went into New York City to a Jewish jeweler who was friends with Bishop Fulton Sheen. And the sisters came with their crucifixes, Catholic sisters, to the Jewish jeweler. And they said, we don't need these crucifixes anymore. So Mother Superior told us to sell them. What are they worth? So the Jewish jeweler, he took them and he weighed them and he said, Oh, I would say they're worth about 30 pieces of silver. And you know what the nun said? That much? We'll take it. So he pulled out 30 pieces of silver and he gave them to the nun and she was so happy and brought them back to the abbess. Then later that Jewish jeweler said, You know, I... I just sold, I, a Jew, just bought crucifixes from you Catholics, and I gave them 30 pieces of silver, and they thought it was great. I thought that meant something to you Catholics, 
What happened to your church? And Bishop Sheen simply says, I told him what happened to my church. And he was baptized a Catholic a month later. What happened to the church? We are the owners of the field. The treasure of great price is the pearl that we have on our necklaces. The great treasure of the field is buried in the field of our holy church and we're ready to sell it. The bishops have been selling the churches in the United States for years and in, and in, and in, and in Europe. They're selling the great treasures. They don't need them anymore. They don't want them anymore. For instance, the bishop in Avrier, France, the Bishop of Angers in France, where I was just a few days ago, there is a beautiful little field where 3,000 martyrs were killed by the French Revolution. And they buried them in a mass grave. And it is a, mar a martyrdom grave of 3,000 saints. And then they, those Catholics built a little chapel, a kind of chapel over it. And they put stained glass windows of these martyrs. And people used to go there and pray. But about five years ago, or maybe ten years ago, the bishop said, we need money. And so they sold the land. And they sold the land, they were going to sell the land to a, a construction company. And the construction company said, you know, when we start digging, there's 3,000 bones there. When we start digging, we're going to hit bones. Then what? Bishop said, don't worry, I won't say a thing. And finally the masons that were going to buy it said, you know, we're not going to dig up 3,000 bones. And they refused to purchase. And so the bishop lost his money. He was going to destroy the stained glass windows, but one of the parishioners came and took out the windows so that he couldn't destroy them. And they said, look, we will give them back to you when you allow the people to go and pray there again. And this kind of thing is happening everywhere in the world, in our Catholic Church. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a field in which there is buried a great treasure. Now in the parable we consider this. The man who owns the field doesn't know there's a treasure. But you know one of the problems is, who buried the treasure in the field? <laughs> who hid the treasure? It was the original owner that hid the treasure. The Jews hid the treasure in their Old Testament. And then when Jesus Christ came, they sold the field. <laughs> we don't need Jesus Christ. We don't need this new Messiah. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. We want nothing to do with him. And the Gentiles said, all right, if you don't want this great treasure, we'll buy it. And they bought it. And those the Jews called the Goy, the Goyim, the scum of the earth. They bought this treasure of great price. They bought the field and they took out that treasure and they became the saints of our holy church. And they spread the faith of Jesus Christ throughout the whole world. That faith that was supposed to be spread by the Jews. Now we are at the end of the age of the Gentiles. The age of the Jews is coming back. We are at the end of the age of the Gentiles. And who has been carrying this great treasure of the faith inside of this field? It is the Gentiles who have held the faith for the last 2,000 years. And now these bishops say, I don't want these bones of saints. I don't want these stained glass windows. I don't want these relics. You know, you go to Rome now, and the Romans block you from receiving relics. They don't want you to honor the saints. They are taking away our faith. They are selling it for money. They are destroying it. Look at the new churches. Look here in Goa, it's the same as everywhere in the world. The church is built by Catholics, they are beautiful. The church is built by modernists, they are disgusting. <laughs> Look at all the churches built since 1960s and 1970s. Are you going to bring tourists to Goa to see those churches? Look at this beautiful, repulsive, disgusting, vile piece of concrete that is empty and means nothing. Look at this vile glass. Look at that vile table which is sitting there like a barren thing that has no value and has nothing of any significance to it. That's where our priest says his per worship. What has happened to the great treasure? I was in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City 
about a year and a half ago or two years ago, and I met a priest. And he said, what are all these side altars for? You know, they have so many side altars to all the different saints. And they have, they have candles burning in front of them. They didn't destroy the side altars. They're still there. Priests used to say Mass on those altars every day. Hundreds of priests used to say Mass in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City every day. When you would walk into that church, you would see priest after priest after priest saying the Mass. And now, only 50 years after the new Mass has come into being, the priest says, I don't know why these altars are here. I don't know why they put them there. He did not even know the treasure of the Mass. He didn't know that priests used to say Mass every day, even by themselves, and that no matter how many priests came to a church, everyone had to say his own Mass. He didn't know. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a field in which is buried a great treasure. The tragedy of it is that the man that buried the treasure got Alzheimer's. He got Alzheimer's. He didn't remember that he buried the treasure. First, he didn't remember where the treasure was, and then he forgot that he had treasure. And then he sold the field. One of my brother's friends, rednecks of Kentucky, he says, you know what, they, they, he works at a, at a, uh, uh, a uh, what do you call that, a, a garbage dump. He says, you know that people take, they take safes, and they throw them in the garbage dump because they don't have the key. So we get a drill, and we drill a hole, and we drill through the safe, we open it, and sure enough, there's gold in there, there's money in there, there's jewelry in there, there's treasures in there. He says, do you return? He goes, no, it's called the stupid clause. <laughs> if you're stupid enough to take your safe and throw it in the dump, I'm taking what's on inside, inside of it. People come every day and they bring, or every week, and they bring a safe. They, we don't have the key for the safe. They shake it. It's got stuff in it. What's in it? I don't know. What do you put in the safe? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's gold. Maybe it's thousands of dollars worth of stuff and you're living in debt. Oh, I don't have a key here. And so they throw it away. They throw away the treasures that they have buried in the field. And this is what has happened today in our Holy Church. Catholic priests in the Philippines, they see the wrath of God visit the Philippines in the year 2013. I was just there last year. I'm going from here to the Philippines the next week. And the wrath of God visited the Philippines with the largest typhoon ever recorded in history last year, killing more than 50,000 people. Do you know what the newspaper said? Maybe as many as 3,000 died. I was there a week afterwards, last year in September. And there are bodies everywhere. Whole villages wiped out. They just simply took the bodies and they dug these mass graves and threw them in the graves. The whole city of, of, of uh, the Tacloban in the Philippines, Leyte, destroyed like a nuclear bomb hit it. The largest winds that have ever hit the shore in the last 300 years, as long as typhoons have been recorded, the greatest typhoon ever recorded, killing thousands and thousands of people because God is angry. Why? Because in December of 2012, the Filipino people voted that they will have only two children in their families. That it is illegal to have more than two children. And they have what's called the RH Bill, the Reproductive Health Bill. And Catholics voted for the death of children. Catholics voted for the death of their families. They voted against the law of God. And in the next year there was a war. And there was a great earthquake. The month before this typhoon, in the church, the oldest church in the Philippines, the bell tower broke. And the second oldest church in the Philippines collapsed. I used to visit that church often in the island of a hole. And other churches were destroyed. And I've been visited by so many earthquakes in the last 400 years. But that earthquake finished them off. Because God is angry. And they're giving away the treasure of their faith. A Catholic country giving away the treasure of their faith. Selling the field. Who wants to buy the field? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a field in which is buried a great treasure. But who gets that treasure? It says it in the second parable. 
Merchants. What are merchants? Negotiators. Negotiators, it says in Latin. People that are negotiating trying to get a good deal. Negotiators. They want to get the treasures. There are some people looking for happiness. There are some people looking for perfect happiness. There are some people looking for truth. And they want all truth. There are some people searching the whole world. I want the truth. I want happiness. And they search and they search and they search. And they see so many plastic pearls. And they see so many fake jewelers selling made in China goods. <laughs> One day, amongst all these jewels, they find there is a real pearl that is not false. There is a real pearl that is perfect, but the owner doesn't even know it. I will sell all I have, buy that pearl, and then I will become truly rich. These are the souls that God is sending to us now. There are some souls in the world, perhaps you are some of them, looking for the truth, but they don't know where to find it. Looking for the great pearl of great price. Looking for the treasure buried in the field. And they've already looked at the treasures offered by the world today. These treasures lead to despair. These treasures lead to drugs. These treasures lead to suicide. There must be a treasure that's worth more than that. <coughs> this is the treasure of the true Holy Roman Catholic faith. It's our treasure. The tragedy of the field is that the one that buried the treasure has forgotten where he buried the treasure and then he got Alzheimer's and he forgot that he had the treasure and then he sold the field at a cheap cost. Judas was ordained a priest. He was consecrated a bishop. He was a true apostle of Jesus Christ. He was to be one of the twelve judges that would judge all men at the end of time. And what did he sell it for? Thirty pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. The tragedy, says St. Augustine, of man is that he sells God too cheap. We're always worried about being ripped off. About being taken advantage of in business. And the only business that matters is the business of our salvation. The business of going to heaven. The business of fulfilling our purpose as men, which is to give glory to God and to spread His kingdom. That's the business that matters. And we sell it too cheap. We sell it too cheap. And then we lose everything. So we must not sell Christ too cheap. It's one of the ways of mocking God. To sell Him at a low price. He's not worth much. Judas, as Bishop Sheen points out, when he saw that bottle of nard, a little bitty bottle of oil, of ointment, perfume, owned by St. Mary Magdalene, it was worth 300 denarii. About 10 times as much as Jesus Christ was worth. He was only worth 30. But that was worth 300. And then... Mary Magdalene took that golden little bitty ointment and she broke it and it went all over the floor. And maybe a little bit of it touched the feet of Christ. And then Judas said, to what purpose is this waste? You know, that's what people are saying today. Why did the church waste all this money on beautiful cathedrals? Why does it waste all this money on beautiful chalices? Why does it wait all this money on this place that is called the house of God? Why doesn't it spend the money for the poor? That's what Judas said. This could have been sold and given to the poor. And what does the gospel evangelist tell us? I believe it's St. John. He did not say this because he loved the poor. He said it because he was in charge of the money and he was a thief. And know this about the social justice crowd in the Catholic Church today. One good example is Pope Francis, the humble Pope. <laughs> the humble Pope who's going to distribute his money to the poor. Only he lives in a fancy hotel. And he is living in the lap of luxury. But he gives the name of being poor. It's not true. 
And so it is of many priests today. You go to the church and it is empty and cold, but go to the rectory. Very beautiful furniture. Very nice things. Why do they say we must give to the poor? Because they are thieves. And they want the treasure for themselves. And therefore the evangelist tells us, and Judas said, to what purpose is this waste? This could have been sold for 300 pieces of silver. And we could have used the money and given it to the poor. And I would have got my cut. I know the Indian rule. 80-20. 80% for me, 20% for the job. Of which part of that, of course, is my pay. The 80-20 rule. That's the rule of Judas. They speak of a treasure. But Lord Jesus Christ said, But what does a negotiator do? What does the true merchant do? He looks for the true pearl of great price. And when he knows it's a pearl of great price, how does he prove it? He sells all he has. He's ready to give up everything to get that pearl. That's how he proves it. He's ready to give up everything in order to buy that field because it's the only treasure worth having. And this is what makes the Catholic different from the mercenary. He's ready to give up everything for that pearl. Everything for that treasure. Now, are we ready to give up everything for the treasure of our faith? Are we ready to give up everything for the treasure of this holy gospel and the holy truth that only comes from God and from the true Holy Roman Catholic Church and from nowhere else? Are we ready to sell such great treasure that God gave us at baptism? Are we ready to sell it at so low a price for the false pleasures of the world that will be taken away from us? It's foolishness, the life of the sinner. But the wise man follows the saints. The wise man follows the just man who sells all he has to get the great treasure. As we must thank God for the treasure of the faith that he gives to us and ask that he send souls, so many lost souls throughout the world, who though they are lost souls and do not know where to go, I remember that St. Mary Magdalene did not know where to find Christ on Easter Sunday morning, but she went looking for him anyway, and therefore Christ found her. And if we search for the pearl of great price, even if we don't know where it is, and we don't know where to look, and we don't know what it looks like, and we don't know what to look for, but if we really want the pearl of great price, which is the sacred and divine truth that is Christ himself, the sacred and divine love, which is the blessed sacrament, the sacrament of charity. The sacred and divine faith, which comes to us at the holy sacrament of baptism. The holy sacred church. If we really want the pearl of great price, even if we don't know where to look, Christ will see that we find it. Let's pray for such souls. And for God to give us the great desire to find the pearl of great price. The same Proxidus did one of the great martyrs of 1,400, 700 years ago, and that we also go after that pearl of great Christ, and when we hold on to it, never, never, never let go. We'll say God bless you all, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.